I think it's safe to say that no metal band formed in the last 30 years has had more of an influence on music than Meshuggah. Metal bands love them, jazz musicians love them, and, more recently, academics have started loving them. My goal in this video is to lay out the basics of the rhythmic style in a clear, easily digestible way with reference to some of the academic music theory about their music. If you're already familiar with Meshuggah's basic style, don't worry, there's going to be a lot of cool, unusual riffs in here too. Meshuggah has a pretty clearly defined core rhythmic style, which can be summed up in one sentence, but also offers infinite variety. They generally write looping, asymmetric guitar riff patterns, which phase against quadruple meter backbeats, and are truncated to realign at hypermetric boundaries. Definitely a mouthful. Let's break it down. The first part, asymmetric guitar riff patterns, is probably the first thing to hear right off the bat. One of the simplest is from Straws Pulled at Random. Here, the guitar riff is a quick loop lasting for seven eighth notes. These riff patterns are often longer and more involved. Here's a more complicated one from Born in Dissonance, which lasts for 15 quarter notes before repeating. Counting this riff as 15 quarter notes isn't that easy. When first making sense of a lot of Meshuggah's riffs, I like to use something that I'm going to call Meshuggah counting, which is different from regular metric counting. This method of counting focuses on what changes in the riff, not necessarily how many eighth notes or whatever the riff lasts for. For Born in Dissonance, I would use Meshuggah counting to say that it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4, which means something like this. One da da one two da da one two three da da one two three four da da one two three four da da one two three four da da, etc. What I'm counting are the guitar accents in the riff that change, and realizing that that little tag, the da-da, is the same every time. This simplifies my hearing quite a bit. Another classic example of where this is useful is in Provis, which goes one, two, one, three, one, two, one, four. If I were to write this as an additive meter, it would be something like 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 4 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 5. I think it's easier to simplify this and use Meshuggah counting to just count the higher pitched accent groups here and in a lot of Meshuggah's riffs. So you're trying to analyze a Meshuggah riff and you figured out the asymmetric guitar pattern, maybe with the help of Meshuggah counting. But what are the drums doing? Generally, the kick drums will follow the guitar pattern, but the cymbals and snare won't. Instead, these drums will imply some repeating pattern lasting for four beats. In its most common form, the cymbals will pound out the beat and the snare drum will hit on beat three of each of these four beat cycles. We can think of this as a kind of halftime version of the classic rock backbeat. Instead of the snare on beats 2 and 4, we've zoomed out and are just hitting on beat 3. Here's a super classic example. Don't worry about the guitars, just focus on the cymbals and snare. The tricky thing, of course, is that the guitar riffs are almost never the same length as this drum pattern. This means that because both are looped exactly, they phase against each other. This is pretty easy to visualize. I think about blocks of different lengths, 
being laid out on top of each other. Here's one of these phases for Perpetual Black Second, where the guitar riff pattern lasts for 7 eighth notes against the 4 quarter notes of the drum pattern. Because the two loops have different lengths, they move or phase relative to each other. The snare hit comes at a different place in the guitar pattern each time around. Focusing on one pattern tends to make it hard to hear the other one. This is part of what makes Meshuggah's music hard to get a hold of. If you lock into the familiar drum pattern, the guitar riffs tend to sound chaotic. If you figure out the guitar riff and focus on that, the drum accents become unpredictable. That's two out of three parts of that sentence about Meshuggah's basic style. But if you listen carefully to Meshuggah's guitar riff patterns, you probably notice that they don't just continue non-stop. Instead, they seem to skip at certain points. This brings us to the third part of that sentence. Guitar riffs tend to be truncated at regular hypermetric boundaries to realign with the drums. In simpler language, this means that after 8 or 16 or 32 or 64 or 128 beats, the guitar riff will stop wherever it is and either it will restart or will move on to a new riff. These multiples of 4 beats are called hypermeter. We can think of them as zoomed out versions of the 4 beats of the drum pattern. Here's straws pulled at random again. That 7-8 guitar pattern is repeated four times fully, and then for four eighth notes of the next one, which adds up to 16 quarter notes. Here's Born in Dissonance again as another example, which has a longer pattern and takes longer to realign. Here, the guitar pattern, which lasts for 15 quarter notes, is repeated four times fully, and then we get four quarter notes into the fifth repetition, which coincides with 16 cycles of the four quarter note drum pattern. I call this last truncated iteration of the guitar riff pattern and the big realignment with the drums that are so characteristic of Meshuggah's music, the polymetrical cadence. Like harmonic cadences, they take us from a state of instability, metric dissonance, to fleeting relative stability. So those are the basics. Looping asymmetric guitar riff patterns which phase against quadruple meter backbeats and are truncated to realign at hypermetric boundaries. I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about two other things. First, the question of meter in Meshuggah's music, and second, some of the ways in which they play with this basic style in various ways. I've mostly avoided talking about the guitar patterns and drum patterns in terms of meters and time signatures. A lot of people will say the drums are in 4-4 instead of saying the drums repeat a 4-beat pattern. However, as I mentioned earlier, there isn't much evidence that most people can actually hear two meters at the same time. Saying that the drums are in 4-4 while the guitars are in 7-8 therefore probably doesn't describe how we actually hear things. Instead, as I mentioned earlier, we will tend to pick one and treat the other pattern as unusual accents against that pattern. In additionally, there's the fact that the band unswervingly swears that their music is all in 4-4. Everything is, is, for us in the band, is about the, how, how things groove towards a simple, straight 4-4 beat. In the sense that at a zoomed out level, strong structure and the drums tend to be built around groups of four beats, this is definitely true. It's a little harder to imagine that the guitarists hear the riff patterns as odd accents against 4-4. Eric Smalek has argued as much, saying that they claim that their music involves no calculation. Our music has nothing to do with math. And is all about a basic rock 4-4 backbeat, partly because that's what's expected of rock and metal musicians when they're interviewed. Eric further shows that some level of calculation, or compositional thinking, was almost definitely at play in some of their music. For my part, I think I sit somewhere in the middle. I've become more and more convinced over the years that the entire band must be hearing primarily in relation to a solid 4-4 beat, rather than the guitarist hearing in odd meters and Thomas Hawk hearing in 4-4. 
when I really get one of their riffs down, I can hear this way, tuning into the drums while my fingers keep making the weird patterns happen. However, I think this split perspective is an accurate way of describing how most fans hear the music. They either focus on the guitar pattern and hear this unusual pattern against a strong beat, but don't really group that beat into fours, or they focus on the drums and hear the guitar parts as an unexpected accent structure against them. All this is to say that questions of meter are complicated in Meshuggah's music. Now, for some of the ways that Meshuggah plays with this basic style. I'll talk about a few of these, but the list is, of course, not exhaustive. First, compound beats. Most of Meshuggah's riffs are based on either two or four pulses per beat, but sometimes they play with compound beat divisions, meaning three pulses per beat. These riffs tend to have a special, striking sort of slipperiness to them. Here's a classic example from Dancers to a Discordant System. Everything else is the same. The drums are still outlining four beat cycles with a snare hit on beat three, and the guitars are still looping until a hypermetric boundary. It's just that there are three pulses per beat instead of two or four. They've tended to use more of these on later albums. It's a different kind of groovy world. Second, the length of the guitar pattern can vary dramatically. Early ones tended to be shorter. Shorter revolution back then. Here's a short, simple one from Humiliative, which lasts for 11 eighth notes. And here's a much longer, more recent one from Violent Sleep of Reason, which lasts for a whole 55 eighth notes before starting to repeat. This is also another example of a compound beat division. Third, they play with how long the guitar pattern loops before being truncated at a hypermetric boundary. Sometimes it will be made to line up again very quickly, as in Straws Pulled at Random, where it was only 16 quarter notes before the polymetrical cadence. Other times, the guitar pattern will run for a very long time before being truncated. The last appearance of the bleed herta runs for almost a full minute before it's interrupted by the song's end. An even longer, subtler one is in Do Not Look Down, where the guitar pattern continues uninterrupted for nearly two whole minutes from the start of the song to the solo.
Fourth, there's a lot of variation in what the drums do. The classic thing is to have the kick drums lined up with the guitars, the cymbals hitting every beat, and the snare hitting on beat three of each four beat loop. However, Thomas Hocka does a million interesting things, from playing the backbeat so faint you can barely hear it, like in the first riff from Clockworks, obscuring the backbeat at the end of a hypermetric section to create more of a push towards the polymetric cadence, as in this other riff from Violent Sleep of Reason. This basic structure, with these modifications, accounts for the vast majority of Meshuggah's riffs. If you're listening to their music and listen close enough, you'll almost definitely find a repeating guitar pattern and a regular hypermetric background structure. However, there are a few riffs that don't quite fit in. You can find these in a few places in their earlier albums. More recently, the most common outliers are sections where the guitar riff is not actually built around a repeating pattern. Most famously, these happen a lot in the EPI and in Catch 33 but there are a few other examples. The last riff I'll play today is one of my favorite recent examples of this from near the end of Clockworks. Here, the guitar riff has a cool repeating additive process, but doesn't actually literally repeat itself. The pattern keeps growing for the whole uh, section and then eventually repeats at a hypermetric boundary. I've covered a lot of ground here and also only barely scratched the surface. There are a bunch of sources for deeper dives in the description, which have everything from cool graphical representations of riff sections to analyses of riffs that seem to start in the middle and riffs where pitch and rhythm are on different cycles. And I'll keep posting more detailed analyses of specific Meshuga riffs on this channel every once in a while. You can basically drop the needle anywhere in their discography and have something interesting and unique to talk about. But what I think is super cool about Meshuggah's music is that there are these ubiquitous structures which give us expectations about how each riff will go and give us a way to say what's interesting and exciting about each riff based on how it goes along with or undermines these larger patterns. 
I hope this video has helped make some of these larger patterns clearer. Thanks for watching. Let me know what your favorite Meshuggah riff is on the village message board down below. Do that other stuff too if you're into it. See ya.